get as many parents to town meeting as possible. So this um, is kind of a campaign that instead of talking to everybody, if everybody just talks to 10 people and gets 10 people to commit to attend town meeting, 50 of us do that, and we had a meeting on Monday night, and there were 35 people. I've already got some back by email, somebody emailed me one back. 50 people get 10 people, we'll have 500 parents there. Um, and we need representation of parents who are representing their children's educational interests at town meeting, because that's where all these decisions are actually made. And we've worked really hard to push to make sure that the schools are adequately funded for next year. And we're close, we're not all the way there, but um, we are in a much better situation than we were a year ago. But we need you to come to town meeting. So this is basically explains, um, I've asked you to email it to me, mail it to me, drop it in my mailbox, whatever you've got to do, but please follow through with this um, because it's imperative that we have as many parents there um, on April 7th as possible. So I'm gonna hand these over to Well, Kara's passing that around, my third ask for you. Um, on April 15th, with this, which is just two weeks from now, Stanford Children is hosting its third Day on the Hill. They're not going to have a rally on the Common. However, we are going to visit with all the senators and lots of the legislators that make up the House, you know, House and Senate Ways and Means Committee and some other influential committees. Now. <laughs> Three years ago, we had two representatives from North Reading, and that was great. Michelle Spur and I took on the charge, um, and met with Senator Tarr, which was which was terrific. It was a great exposure and a huge learning experience. We've never done anything like that before, but here we are today, and look at all of you. So, last year, Stan harnessed 2,000 people from 85 communities, and there were four of us. And I think that Gina and Janine and uh, Janice Gray and I found it to be an extremely empowerful, um, empowering experience because we stood with 2,000 people who had a common goal to do what was right for their children. And there was nothing more exciting than that, to know that we are not alone, that if we work together, we will accomplish something very, very concrete. So that day is coming. Registration is required. It is a little different this year because we are going to meet with senators and legislators you do have to uh, register because there's going to be a um, presentation at the beginning. There's only seats for 600, but I think um, there were 100 people or so that they had already had as of the other night. So if you are going to join us and we would like everyone to consider that, you just need to fill this out and join online or send this in as well. Or if you want to send them all to my house, I'll get them to where they need to go. That's fine as well. So three things for you, three things for you. All right, my first ask is, um, Brad, I've been listening to you. I take really good notes for a good reason. And you say that we always come to you, or people like us always come to you during budget season. And you're right, because that's when we're hoping to make the most influence. However, that's also your very busiest period. And you keep saying July 1st, July 1st. Come back to us on July 1st, after the budget season is over. So on July 1st, once this budget season is over and you have a little bit of time, we're going to ask for you to take a stab or move something forward, as Bruce was talking about at the adequacy study, move something forward or help you to know, let us help you move something forward. Mm -hmm. What do we do? To whom do we address? What exactly do we need to do to make forward? Make, let's have a celebration day. July 1st is Chapter 70 Reform Day. How do we make that happen? <laughs> <laughs> what do we need to do to make July 1st a very, very special day? Yeah. It could be so a great birthday yeah. present, though, right? <laughs> it could be a new beginning for Chapter 70 reform. Um, North Reading is not whole. Our school system still needs $234,000, which is level three on that uh, priority pyramid. And that would only get us back to the cuts that we experienced because of our failed override. It doesn't address anything related to future quality, enrollment needs, or anything else for that matter. We need a minimum of $234,000 that I would like not to have to succeed in override or otherwise um, to get us back to where we were two years ago. A minimum. Can you find us at least $234,000 right now? <laughs> 
You said concrete specific. That specific a minimum of two hundred thirty-four thousand dollars would pay for the teachers to fix that you know that pyramid and their benefits. Is the number that's the number we have. We also need additional aid for special education. Just this year alone, we had two hundred eighty thousand dollars in unanticipated costs. That money is going to come from this educate you know our budget somewhere. So can we find a minimum? of $280,000 right now to help us out of this situation. Those are minimums. Well, I can tell you right now it would be very difficult because we're in the middle of, of the budget year, but let's talk about 09, which is the only thing we really have the potential to affect. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty that we're going to have is trying to give the community that in time to budget it because we haven't debated and won't have debated the state budget until after town meeting. Right. So it's hard to say that we can find it now, but, but here's what we can do. Um, I've already mentioned that we're going to try to recapture some of that federal money on Medicaid. And what we may ask you to do mm -hmm. is to write to the federal delegation mm -hmm. and ask them to help us. We need to formulate that ask. before we, There's probably about a week and a half worth of work before we're ready to do that. Um, with regard to uh, the 234000 the difficulty is going to be trying to identify where we do that. It's going to be harder for Brad than for us. We, we, I can obviously just offer an amendment and add that money. We mentioned trying to put another $100 uh, million dollars in. That may be within reach to for us to offer, and then we take a lot of lobbying to get there. I don't know if the House, I think that's going to be awfully hard for a House member to do, even the leader. No, I mean, I, I, we're gonna, I'm sure it's probably going to be concluded. We haven't done the budget order yet, but, and I vote against it. Anyway, but. Yeah. It's easier for us to think about that amendment and try to figure but out I mean, where we find In all honesty, I mean, you know, offering things is nice. It, it's also nice to maybe cut the list down and try to work on things that we can get now. So, we sort of, uh, we can offer all the things we want, but I'm more interested in sort of the end of the day. We offer things worth a million dollars, or we got we got something worth two hundred thousand dollars, which ultimately, at the end of the day, two hundred thousand is actually cash or a check or whatever that we can use. Whereas the million dollars is sounds like stuff. Getting back to the um, the ask about you know you mentioned the advocacy study and how critically important it is in the process. You know, agree with it. Like it was a little bit longer, and we have to use a new act years into the five-year plan, and then there's this readiness project. Um, again, getting back to that. You know, obviously the governor appointed us a, a secretary of education for that. Is this a person that we, you know, that, that you know, the advocacy study should be directed towards, that this should be, you know, should this, should that be a pressure person here, should we be here? Well, well, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great thought. I mean, one of the things I think we should all do is, is write a letter to the adequacy project folks, or the readiness project folks, and saying you need to focus on Chapter 70. Right. How, how can you begin to talk about that's, readiness that's exactly if we're missing the most fundamental point of how we fund education? The long-term funding people were this big of a group, and everybody else about growing programs and expanding, yeah, expanding, exactly. expanding, getting out of, you know, it was this long. So, with, you know, approximately 186 people on those subcommittees, and they appointed Secretary of Education to coordinate these efforts, and that's someone that we should be contacting. And, Again, we're making note of the concept of the act. Do you think that would help? Is that something we could Well, let me let me phrase it differently. I would feel remiss if we didn't do it. Okay. If we if we let this discussion go forward, and at the end of this enormous readiness project on which the governor has predicated uh, all of his future actions, if we didn't try to say that that should include Chapter Seventy reform, shame on us. Right. I mean, it should be obvious, but. I'm not so sure it is obvious. No, it wasn't right obvious from looking at the subcommittee groups that it was a focus. So I, I think it is a focus, and I think it clearly is a, an existing problem, one that you said a lot of people are admitting to. No one's really up for the charge or challenge of fixing it for a number of political reasons. Um, but it needs to be fixed, and we just, we're a voice, we're a concerned voice, um, and we realize that we feel shortchanged there, and we feel it's definitely in, you know, not equitable. We need to fix that so that everything else can build upon that and the systems and the programs can all be leveled out after we fix the, the critical funding of our core education.
educational needs, which we depend highly. You know, it's the difference between when we have a budget gap, it's like, geez, let's pray, let's go say a prayer that this, this money's going to 